Welcome back to the Carp Angler Chronicles podcast. This is episode number 27, where we sit down with Dr. Patrick Mills and go in depth about amino acids. Now, you don't need to be a chemist or a biologist or anything like that to learn from this episode. We've consciously tried to not go too in depth with things. We wanted to make sure that everyone could actually take something from this episode. That being said, for those diehard bait buffs that listen in, you're definitely going to get something from this as well. Um, it's mostly about amino acids, but Patrick does divulge some other information, which is quite eye opening. Um, something that's quite stand out is his opinion on betaine, which he's gained that opinion through tank testing of his own. Uh, that is quite an eye opener. You definitely want to listen in for that segment. Before we jump into the episode, I want to obviously announce that this is brought to you by Carp Hunter Giveaways. I'm actually even more impressed with these guys than I than I first was. Um, the more I look into their company and look at what they're doing, the more impressed I am. You can find out for yourself at carphuntergiveaways.co.uk. They literally have loads of different prize draws happening all the time um, and they're not crappy gifts either that they're, they're not you know bits and bobs that you'd never want they're actually really high quality um, pieces of equipment bivvies waders bite alarms rods reels barrows everything that you can think of to suit every budget there's there's a prize draw for it that's for sure um, so go and check them out for yourself i think you'll be quite impressed with what they're doing you can find them at carphuntergiveaways.co.uk with that being said let's jump into this episode i hope you enjoy essentially we think identical for all cyprinoid species and that's been controversial because there has been a thought that different amino acids stimulate different fish but that's not true at all we've recently found out it's the concentration of the amino acid that stimulates fish because for example a catfish has loads of receptors and it takes a lower concentration to stimulate catfish the goldfish has many less maybe a factor of 100 less and it takes that order of magnitude higher concentration to get the same effect. Very interesting. We we'll def, we'll go into the uh, we'll go into depth about that later on. I'm I'm sure we will. Um, good stuff. Let's kick it off. Uh, welcome back to the Carp Angler Chronicles podcast. This episode is most definitely one for the bait enthusiasts. Today's guest is someone you might not have heard of, but if you've been angling for a while, you've probably used a bait or a product that was at least influenced by him, if not designed by him. He's a chemist, scientist, lecturer, research, coordinator, probably a lot more. I'm sure he can fill us in on the details. <laughs> Patrick Mills, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Sam. Good to see you. Hello, Did Pete. I forget anything there? What, what, what else you got for us? You forgot the CAC grade three in French there, Sam. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Fluent in <laughs> French. <laughs> Fair enough. We got Pete as well. Hey, guys, you all right? How you doing, Patrick? Yeah. All good, thanks. Perfect stuff. Uh, so, I mean, today's podcast really is going to be in-depth, uh, particularly about amino acids, but uh, Patrick's got a, a, a wealth of information and knowledge. So before we jump into all of the tech stuff, tipple of the episode... Now, before we go on, I'm making a public vow to people not to drink so much. I've been drinking way too much on the last ones. On uh, the last one with um, Jason Ryder, I had a whole bottle of gin and, and the beer, and I was absolutely sloshed. So today I'm taking it a little bit easier. I've just got a few beers lined up. Um, I know Pete has said that he's going to take it easier as well. Now, Patrick actually lives uh in chicago so it's daytime for you patrick isn't it Are you it is it's just just past 2 30 in the afternoon here so you know <laughs> the sun is over the yard arm as we say right yeah you're not going to be drinking too heavy i'm guessing um i'm gonna you know i've already finished my work for the day so uh you know i know you guys like to have a beer when you're talking so i'm gonna join you and i you know i went to my local uh beer warehouse because they're a thing here and i found my favorite lager which is stiegel uh, goldbrow which is a vienna style lager out of salzburg in austria and good old speckled hen which is one of my favorites from the uk uh which is you know available here in the u.s so that's pretty nice so, good man uh, good man 
<clears throat> what's what's the lager? Steiner. It's called uh, Stieg Stiegel, like it's German for stairs, I believe. There's a picture of a set of stairs on it. S <laughs> T I E G L Stiegel. Mm. Yeah. And it's like a Vienna style, slightly darker lager. Hmm. I have to check that one out. <clears throat> Good old speckled hen. That that's that's been featured Can't beat in the that. podcast yeah. a lot. Yeah, they should sponsor us too much. Speckled hen. Yeah, I found a, a pub actually in Chicago that has old speckled hen in the cask, and I'm like, <laughs> I was telling my wife we need to go back there because they also have awesome fish and chips, which is hard to find here. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I bet. I mean, obviously, you you used to live in the UK. We'll talk about that uh, yeah. in a moment. Pete, what, what are you drinking? Um, I'm keeping it local tonight. So like you said earlier, Sam, I'm being sensible. Um, and I've just got Lawan with me tonight, and I'm just going to have a nice chilled bottle of Doombar. Um, All right. So yeah, it's a Sharps Brewery, which is brewed locally to me. I was going to say, when I was back in the UK, my favourite beer of all time is actually Otter Ale from Ottery St. Mary in Exeter. I was down there at Teacher Training College years ago, and uh, that's my absolute favourite UK beer. You, you can't say that on this podcast, unfortunately. I can't, because you're from Cornwall or something, right? <laughs> you can, but it's the otter thing. So you probably don't have oh, this oh, oh, yeah. US, but I don't know how, how aware you are. But um... I'm aware of the otter situation, but it's based off the Ottery St. Mary. Where the... <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I've, uh, you know, my, uh, my fine-tuned English sense of humour has died off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just joking, yeah. I know. <laughs> Go on, Sam. And what have you got tonight, mate? Uh, I'm flying the old Cornish flag a little bit as well. I've got an Atlantic Pale Ale by Sharps. Nice. Um, I've got two Hop House 13 lagers. I've got a Mad Goose Premium Pale Ale, uh, which is by Purity Brewing Company. And I've got a Cotswold Ale, because obviously I'm a Cotswold boy, born and now living. Um, Cotswold Ale by hook norton brewery so five oh, beers right. that is my limit tonight so i'll be on my best behavior <laughs> okay <laughs> don't need to worry patrick we'll, we'll be we'll be all nice mm. <laughs> cool so i mean look where, where do we start that there, there's so much to to talk about just to very briefly fill uh the listeners in uh patrick's obviously has a a great deal of knowledge about um carp attraction um chemo reception etc but he specializes in amino acids so i'm sure a lot of what we'll be talking about today is amino acids um so i mean just kind of before we dump, jump into that stuff patrick just fill us in on on who you are you know your your background in angling as well as that you've obviously worked for for quite a few big um bait companies in the uk just just fill our listeners in on who you are okay well i grew up in uh, dorset actually north dorset and uh, if anyone's familiar with Todber Manor, I was literally two miles from there is where I, where I went to school. <laughs> and uh, I actually came to the States back in 1994 to do a PhD in Chicago. And, you know, the usual thing happens. You meet a girl, you fall in love, and uh, <laughs> I stayed. However, before I came over, I was really, really into uh, fishing, of course. And I, I read um, Kevin Matt's Carp Fever back in 1983. And I've still got it. And it's actually sitting here on the sofa right next to me. And I've got the passage highlighted in his amino acid section in his book. And he talks about how when amino acids are dissolved in water, and that's the key thing, they have to be dissolved and free to move around. Those amino acids, when a fish interacts with them, comes across them, they will stimulate an involuntary feeding response. And his work um, back in the 80s is actually completely in line with academic studies produced later. And what I did, because I got kind of obsessed with this topic back when I was 18, back in the day. And, um, you know, just to jump forward in time, I went through my career, you know, worked here, there and everywhere, and eventually became a college professor in a, in a college here in Chicago, uh, just outside Chicago. And I founded my own research group, and we do research into amino acid stimulants. And um, basically, we went back and we looked at Kevin Maddox's work, and I went and dug through the literature, and you know, reading between the lines, different studies, Kevin Maddox was spot on. Okay. And what Kevin Maddox did, he, you know, he made this leaked table. And if you've ever read the book, lysine and valine are the most potent amino acids when dissolved and everything else is kind of in leaked tables down to not stimulatory from there. Okay. And the one thing Kevin Maddox said, which lit a fire under me many, many years ago, he said, acids when used in combination, which are very unparaphrasing, acids when used by themselves, are not working when used in combination. 
which says to me there's something crazy going on with the receptors as a, a biochemist now. And that's really the genesis of the work. So we've been designing um, amino acid blends that give the perfect stimulatory response. And that's kind of where my research has been for the past, well, since 2009. So, you know, 13, 12, 13 years. And uh, currently I'm, I'm wearing two hats. I have my own little bait company, uh, Biosource Baits, which, you know, I sell a product. And I also work for the US government um, on what's called the Asian carp problem, because I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we have a species of carp here called the big head carp and the silver carp, which are decimating the rivers here. And the USGS is who I work for, the United States government, the United States Geolog Geological Survey. They are looking for ways to trap these fish in nets, and I provide them with attractants to do that. It turns out that cyprinoids generally have a pretty similar chemosensory system. So what works for the carp bait, you know, which we'd like to use, also works for these invasives. So that's pretty much you know, a, a broader kind of description of where I am right now. We can fill in details as you wish. But, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so when were you first uh, either approached by or, or when did you first get involved with a bait company? Oh, it's a very long story. So I, um, soon after I became a tenured professor, and if anybody knows anything about education, is once you become tenured, you're given the freedom to basically explore whichever academic problem you find interesting. So once the job was secured back in 2003, I really dived back into the amino acid work again. And I developed um, our first product, which was called Biosource, which, to be honest, was just a simple one amino acid at a specific concentration. And the key thing is not necessarily the identity of the amino acid, they'll all work. It's the concentration, okay? Because this is our big finding. Our big finding is that amino acids in either singly or in very simple ratio with other amino acids at a fixed concentration or a very narrow range of concentration will give you the response you want. And just to back up a second, that's why I think um, there's been so much kind of hit and miss work with amino acids in, in the angling industries because people, have never really been able to kind of quantify or even find that narrow concentration window where stimulation occurs optimally. And if I like to kind of summarize my research in one sentence, it's finding the optimal concentration range for specific amino acids. That's what we do. So <laughs> with that said, I had this first uh, product and I was, you know, I was shopping it around and, you know, it's like I have the goose that lays the golden eggs, you see, and no one believes me. <laughs> So, of course, I had to get it proven, right? So I sent it out to, uh, you know, my academic friends now at Sparshot College down there in Hampshire. And a student, Tom, um, was given the, the first uh, product, Biosource, it was called. And uh, he did um, a match fishing style comparison. So he had like 20 people sitting in a line like they were match fishing. Same rig, same bait. I think it was pellets. And... Um, you know, they went alternately dosed, undosed, dosed, undosed. And then they looked at the results and every single time there was like, the neighbor would get five pounds, next one, 10 pounds, four pounds, eight pounds. It was a doubling every single time when the person with the bait was compared to the one without the additive in the bait. And that was kind of conclusive. And then we did our own trials, of course, and uh, we got the same result over here when I was out and about with my friends. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Uh, so that kind of proved the point. It proved it worked, but with the one amino acid product, there's a very narrow range of concentration. Okay, so that was, a very, traditionally we'd use that for match fishing applications because in match fishing, it's like you know, a small pot of pellets every, every, after every fish. So we could basically judge the concentration and get it just right by applying a very regimented feeding method, if that makes sense, okay? So that was mission one accomplished, right? <laughs> and uh, we sold that product to um, a company that's now unfortunately out of business. It was original SBS with Des Taylor. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, soon after Des picked up the bait, they actually went out of business. <laughs> so that one never made it to market in the UK, although it is available in the US to this day. I mean, I have a, a few places in the US that sell it. You can look it up online. They'll ship it to you if you want it. But uh, then from there... <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to jump in if you've got any questions, right? No, so, okay, you carry on. Okay. Uh, from there, and because this thing has a very, you know, the single amino acid, you know, and again, it's when it's dissolved in water, right? So it's the ambient surrounding concentration of amino acids, if you like a cloud of amino acids around the fish, right? It has to be of a certain concentration. Okay, then what I discovered, going back to that whole Maddox thing where the two cancel, 
I was thinking, hey, if I put like one of this canceling one in there, so it will tone down or attenuate the response of the first amino acid. And the effect of that is it makes the concentration uh, window broader. So it lasts, you know, over a longer period of time if you want in practice. So that product was actually called Jigsaw. That was my <laughs> less than imaginative name for it. <laughs> but, uh, and that one was actually, you know, again, went to spa shop with it. And this guy, uh, this one, I hope Ollie's listening. If you're there, Ollie, hello, and get back to me on Facebook. because <laughs> I've been trying to talk to him. Uh, student at the time, Ollie, uh, tested uh, Jigsaw. And again, he was actually more into the big carp scene and uh, fished, you know, a bunch of anglers, each with two rods, you know, traditional carp way. And Richworth, it turns out, we were partnering with Richworth uh, at the time, and they supplied the bait. And again, it was actually slightly better than the, the previous one. And uh, so this is more akin to kind of, if you like, proper cut fishing with boilies. And again, we got like, you know, rod A would catch five fish, say, and rod B would catch 10 fish over the period of time. And that was all done at the Lake Dan Spa Shop, which was nice. So Ollie got the same result <laughs> and with just a, just a nudge better results actually it's just it was like 1.9 to 1 or something like that so the, it's literally a two to one difference in catch rate and that's one i've been using almost exclusively for the last five or six years uh until just recently when i found a better what they call them the trade agonist or antagonist right so the two amino acid blend i found a better counter molecule which i've just put into the bait so you could consider jigsaw like a prototype, we swapped one of the amino acids out there and it works even better now. The, uh, to be honest, the stimulation is about the same. It's got a broader window and it's got a longer shelf life. Uh, and that's, you know, just kind of shelf life improvements really that make it better. And uh, that's where we were. And then if you look, uh, you know, there's still a few bags of uh, S-Core. So I helped design the S-Core range for which were back in the day. But that seems to be a trend with me. and. Uh, I guess I'm just unlucky. Literally about three months after we got the Escor uh, brand launched, um, the head of Richworth actually retired and, and it seemed to go downhill a bit from there. And they eventually sold to a third party just recently. So if you do see those bags, they actually don't have the stuff in them anymore, which is unfortunate. <laughs> However, having said that, it is available um, again in the US. And I'm actually looking for a manufacturing distribution partner in the UK for the product. So if anybody's interested, they should contact me. That's where I am with the product. Uh, yeah. What was the question? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we've we've I, moved on from that. <laughs> um, so essentially, sort of from yeah. what you're saying, and you, you kindly sort of sent a few of your, your articles that you've written across. Oh, real quick, there. before I go on, the, those articles are free to anyone. If they just contact me, I'm happy to send them those articles. Okay. Um, I was, I was going to suggest, actually, if we were to like put them on our Facebook page as a file. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, yeah. right. yeah. I mean, they're interesting and, and worth a read. Um, yeah. So, essentially, I think what you're doing, I'm just going to try and break it into sort of layman's terms for the guys yes. who list, the, the listeners, the guys who make their bait at home, is um, yes. essentially with amino acids, um, you're looking at different amino acids. So, some are positively charged and some are negatively charged. Yeah. Is that right? Okay, so you want the whole story or the? <laughs> I, I think yeah, like break, <clears throat> yeah, in in layman's terms, but sort of it, it's interesting, you know. And I think a lot of the guys who listen listen to this will like that. So there are twenty amino acids, a few what we call specials like betaine, which aren't kind of truly amino acids, but they're pseudo amino acids. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's like if you count betaine, twenty one, twenty one amino acids, and they can be split into four characters. Uh, four categories, and it's based on what we call the side chain. So the amino acid molecule is identical. Think of that like the handle of a key or something, or the you know the key fob, right? And then it's the the shaft of the key is what's different. That's the side chain on the amino acid. And each of those twenty one amino acids has a different side chain. Okay, and it's that side chain that kind of interacts with chemosensory receptors. So I mentioned lysine already. Lysine is an extremely potent amino acid because its side chain exactly fits into the receptor. Valine, and if you read Maddox's book, he did this perfectly. Valine is the other really strong amino acid, and it has a different type of side chain, which again, fits into the second. And we think there are, there are actually four receptors. So there's the valine receptor, which is neutral. There's the lysine receptor, which is for basic amino acids, right? Which have, when in water, a positive charge, okay? Then there's the acidic amino acids, 
So MSG, everyone knows of MSG, monosodium glutamate. Well, glutamic acid is an amino acid which can be turned into MSG. And uh, that's an acid and that has its own receptor. And then we have what's called the polar amino acids. Now, those are the ones which should be avoided because, um, as you know, most amino acids are in some way, shape or form attractive or stimulatory, but there's a several which are actually repulsive to fish and that's well known in the literature. And those have polar um, side chains. So that's things like alcohol side chains or SH side chains. I'm getting a bit technical, but basically a polar side chain has plus and minus charge on it. So if I'm gonna break it down, there's no charge on the side chain, a plus charge on the side chain, a minus charge on the side chain, or both charges on the side chain, which we call polar, okay? So there are four types of receptor, but the only ones that actually are significant are the basic amino acid receptor and the non-charged receptor. Those are the ones that do the business. Okay. Um, and you, you mentioned <clears throat> MSG there. So, I mean, that's yeah. something that I've, I've used a bit in, in my, in my yeah. plate making to the past. And he says it has its own receptor. So how, uh, well, how, how would that fit into there? Oh, it's, it's a very good question because people often get confused between um, what is an olfactory response, which is dissolved amino acids. To say it's smell is incorrect, okay? So the chemosensory reception of amino acids is a very, very, very simple uh, device, essentially. Okay, so when I look at a taste bud or, you know, we can, we can like probably differentiate 10,000 different tastes and smells, right? Because we have a very advanced sensory apparatus and so do most modern animals, right? But that's over millions upon millions of years, okay? So imagine you're on something in the Precambrian and you haven't even got a linear body yet, right? <laughs> you have a very, very basic and very, very simple receptor system. And basically what amino acids do, they basically tell the organism, yes or no, this is food. They don't say how fresh it is. They don't say all these other cool things, which we can determine today with our you know, well advanced sensory systems. So if you like, it's a separate, very simple sense of smell and it's yes or no for the presence of food, okay? And it turns out that every living or dead thing is always emitting amino acids into its surroundings. I mean, you're doing it right now, so am I. I mean, uh, you know, you put your hand on the table, you leave fingerprint behind. That fingerprint can be detected by the ninhydrin test which tests for amino acids and sweat. If you're a fish, you don't sweat, but that's okay because you know any excretions from your body go directly into the water and that's acting like a magnet. <laughs> okay, so in the ancient times, fish and other animals were able to find each other and find food by simple like, you know, just swing towards a more higher concentration of amino acids. And I'm getting off track from your question, but real simple, what the product does, it's basically hijack that signal so instead of the fish thinking there's one worm there, it thinks there's a hundred. That's, that's basically what we've done. We've hijacked the kind of food here signal. Okay. Mm. To your question, <laughs> MSG. So some amino acids, in addition to doing the chemosensory thing, which we've just talked about, which they all do very well, some slightly better than others, MSG and for example, glycine have actual taste. Okay. So MSG is in all the foods out there, right? Or used to be back in the day. And it's actually that unami taste. So when you taste soy sauce, for example, that has a high proportion of MSG in it naturally. And that unami taste is what MSG is. And in fact, in Japan to this day, and the salt, pepper, and MSG on the table, and you can sprinkle MSG on your food, it gives it that kind of unami, mushroomy, soy saucy taste. So MSG has a taste, but it also, it's doing double duty, it also has... To be honest, it's actually in the third column. It has a very, very limited stimulatory effect. So it's more about, for MSG, it's more about taste and taste enhancement, like putting salt and pepper on your, on your dinner kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. not to do a chemosensory reception. And glycine is great too. Glycine is a very simple amino acid. It's, like, it's also in a similar kind of strength range as MSG. It's not great as an attractant, but um, it tastes very sweet. And it's actually used as a filler for um, saccharin and other, other little packets of sugar replacements and stuff like that. So some amino acids do taste. So it's, it's hard sometimes when we use those amino acids to decide, hey, is that attractiveness because of taste or because of the chemosensory effect? And to be honest, we tend to avoid those when we test. We tend to go with things that have no taste and no smell because then when we test them in the tank, it must be the chemosensory response. Yeah, sorry to, to butt in there. <clears throat> Have you found that there's sometimes a trade-off um, between the, the olfactory and the gustatory response? 
um, from amino acids? And if there is, is there a workaround for that? Yeah, you're absolutely you're on the right track. That's a really good question because, you know, gustatory means eating essentially, right? So barbels and the mouth, they are tasting essentially, right? So when the fish ingests the food, and there's loads of studies out there about people impregnating amino acids into gelatin, for example, and then seeing how long the fish hold onto that mm. gelatin. Yeah. So retention time in the mouth that's all about taste. So those amino acids we discussed, glycine and MSG, they're going to help retain the, the bait in the mouth because it makes the bait taste good, right? But that's amino acids that are encapsulated in the bait. What we're talking about with chemosensory has got nothing to do with taste. It's all about smell, essentially, right? So, and they have no discernible smell such but we use them always always in combination with the flavor so what my favorite all-time application is i take uh, my amino acid solution we call it impulse that's its trade name and i mix that with corn and then i add a splash of pineapple flavor and that's an absolutely awesome bait because it works in conjunction with the flavor the flavor is actually better at attracting fish and then when they get close the amino acid kind of takes over and puts them into feeding mode so it's, it's a combo effect if you like yeah. In fact, we've shown that. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story from back in the day. When I first invented this stuff, I thought, awesome, I cracked it, right? All I got to do is throw some of this amino acid in the pond and then catch all the fish. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so, what I did was, like, you know, um, we call it kitty litter here, you know, cat litter. Yeah. Litter is kind of this very absorbent clay, right? And that's what it does it absorbs pee from cats, right? It also absorbs any liquid, right? So, what I did was, I got my amino acid solutions and I absorbed them into kitty litter. Okay, and then I kind of dried them off and the, and the amino acids are now dried and stable and they're trapped inside this kind of rock sponge, essentially. Yeah. And then I threw these rock sponges, these tiny gravel pieces, in, you know, into the, into the pond and the amino acids then start to leak out. I'm like, awesome, I just fish over the top of that. I'm going to attract fish without any food. This is going to be awesome. And you know what I caught? One fish. You know why? Because that was the fish that was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> it exactly. Yeah. Right? It wouldn't attract them. And now what I do, and I, I've actually uh, done some real interesting experiments with the USGS, and this is more to do to do with the Asian carp. So we're attracting Asian carp in the river, and what we did was we made a giant lollipop essentially. So imagine a big Tupperware container, like maybe a liter or two, and in that we made a giant lollipop. So molten sugar, and in the molten sugar we dissolved we added actually it wasn't it was suspended it wasn't dissolved powdered amino acid and pineapple flavor. Turns out every carp likes pineapple. Right? <laughs> For an Asian carp, it doesn't matter. So that was by far our most popular flavor with the Asian carp. And we figured it. So when we got these blocks of sugar, which were flavored with amino acid and pineapple, we'd hang them in these kind of long, what they call hoop nets, like a big minnow trap. If you ever, you know, caught minnows in a bowl, <laughs> you know, and, um, and the fish would, you know, we get pre preferentially like many, many Asian carp in the, in the baited rather than not baited. And it was designed so the water flow would dissolve the sugar at the perfect rate and involved a lot of math, but it dissolved the sugar at the perfect rate to make the perfect stimulatory concentration. That's kind of hard to judge. It took a lot of time. It wasn't perfect, but it was definitely catching more fish. So that was kind of proving our model, if you like. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's the flux at that point, you know, the concentration over time of uh, amino acids in the water. We were maintaining, if you like, maintaining the, the threshold concentration. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that just to backtrack a little bit, because this point will be really um, interesting to, to bait makers who are listening. Yeah. You said that you, you're actually reliant upon the flavor to, for the, the longer term attraction, uh, or, or should I say longer long range? range. Long range yeah. yeah, longer yeah. range attraction. Uh, yeah. And then when they get closer, obviously the amino acids take over. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. And that's the current state of play. But you know, we're having a conversation at a very important juncture in this research because um, what I've been re able to do recently, it's kind of a weird concept, but um, I've been able to kind of find what I call like a, a true blocker molecule. Because if I go back to the fish's sensory apparatus, right? So we think about 30% of the receptors engaged. So the olfactory receptor is the chemosensory receptors. If 30% of those are engaged by amino acids, we think we get the perfect response. You know, the number, you know, it's here or there, but it's some fixed number of receptors engaged. Now, this is why the concentration window is so narrow because you kind of, as the concentration increases, as it leaks out of the bait, you get to 30% and then you go over and saturate. Yeah. 
saturate the receptors, they literally turn off. It's like if I gave you two cups of coffee, you'd feel great and you want to go out and do something, right? If I pay you 25 cups of coffee, you just want to lie down. <laughs> mm. You know, that's called fatigue, right? So there's something called fatigue where if you overdo it, they just switch off, right? And, um, and that's what happens because, you know, human nature is, you know, if, if two drops works, great. 50 drops will work much better and it <laughs> kills it, right? Yeah. So it, it's, it's something that I constantly battle. And on my kind of sheet I supply with the product, it says in big friendly letters, right? Do not overdose. Do not use more <laughs> than stated. Otherwise it won't work. So it is, it is literally a case of less is more. Now back to your question of stimulation and attracting over distance. Because, you know, if you think about it, when amino acids exude from a bait or a glug, usually, I like to spray pellets, that's my preferred method, but you have some kind of like free amino acids in the water around your bait, and that's the strongest concentration is going to be right next to the bait. And if you like, as you go further away, the concentration gradient drops off, right? What we're able to do with this new embodiment, this kind of with the perfect blocker, we've got that 30% coverage permanently okay so as long as we get to a minimum value it will work the same so we can have a much higher concentration of solution spread out the attraction over a much wider area and it doesn't matter how far away the fish is from the bait at that point so in the past we've battled this whole gradient thing and i've just i think and i'm, I'm doing um, some uh, literally starting tomorrow actually <laughs> so i'm meeting my students for the first time tomorrow and uh, we're going to try out this new blocking molecule and uh see if it works. I've got some uh, kind of initial results from some field studies I did. And when I say field studies, I go fishing and see what works. <laughs> yeah. So translate that into a fish tank study. And But I'm, I'm confident it's going to work. So uh, watch this space, as they say. I think we may have like version two of the, of the product, or actually version four of the product coming out, maybe next year. Yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting. It's just another case to back up the use of flavors in carp bait. I mean, yeah. Probably around 10 years ago, both me and Pete, were, we were anti-flavors. We, we didn't use yeah. the baits we used to make. Um, but it just shows that, that, I mean, they definitely serve a pace. Do, I mean, are you, you, do you feel that they give a better um, long-range attraction due to yeah. ionization or pH shift? Or is it the, the, the different um, compounds within the flavor that, that carry better in the water? What would you say is working there? longer range well you know i'm not going to step too much outside of my area of expertise but i will offer an opinion i mean um flavors i mean they just it's just putting a smell in the water right and it's like you know it's like you know like the old it's like like the movies you see like chumming for sharks or something mm. right in the war i this is how i start fishing in the united states i i get a can of cream corn right and in that can of cream corn i put a big splash of uh pineapple flavor and the right amount of impulse and then I just take my pole cup because, you know, when I'm doing tests, I like to fish from small carp. So I use like a pole apparatus, pole setup. And I just basically take a big old pole pot and just dump the whole lot. And it's like a soup, right? And that soup's got no food in it. And it goes in right at the start just to attract fish to the area. And then I, you know, and then I just go through the, the motions of setting up and plumbing up and all that kind of stuff. And then after about 15, 20 minutes, I go back as always fish there. So, yeah, that's basically a very strongly flavored goop right now here's the thing people say well if it's too strong a flavor it's going to put the fish off that could be true right but by the time i come to fish it's dissipated <laughs> so you know then i'm just fishing like normal so my opinion is that too much flavor is probably a bad thing um but then if you want to draw fish from a distance you need a lot of flavor and i think the way to go around it is to put a bunch in wait <laughs> and then fish mm -hmm. what, is, what is it about the, i mean sweet corn like absolute classic very very efficient yeah. do you feel it's the amino acids content of the sweet corn that's so effective or? okay yeah this is uh, something pete kind of alluded to earlier which i didn't kind of follow up on um every food has proteins right more mm -hmm. or less and those proteins break down to give amino acids right and we mentioned that we're leaving amino acids wherever we go because our bodies are always breaking down and building up again that's true for any living thing and those broken down product of protein decomposition are amino acids, and we just leave them everywhere, right? But what we exude is a profile, and everybody's heard that word profile, right? So proteins, be them vegetable or animal, have this kind of mixture of all 20 amino acids in slightly different amounts, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I think get a little bit too caught up on profiles because they're all quite similar, <laughs> you know? They all provide some of each amino acid, unless it's some weird... Um, 
weird product like uh, the certain uh, types of maize here in the in the US that are low in lysine, which is not great. But um, so don't, else. don't they produce high lysine maize as well? Yeah, dent, it's called dent corn. Yeah, yeah. so it's yeah. genetically modified to be have more lysine in it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, to be honest, I mean, the food, uh, you know, in, in the fish's natural environment provides them with all the amino acids they need. In my opinion, there is really no kind of magic profile, right, that makes the bait more attractive. It, it, sure, it, it's attractive if you like add, you know, hydrolyzed vegetable protein or any of these hydros, right? It puts a food signal there. Like we talked about soy sauce. It's basically putting soy sauce around the bait, right? Like Thai fish sauce. That's kind of the same idea. Um, but that should be decoupled. It should be not counted in the same breath as single and double amino acid attraction, which if you want to kind of think about it, we take one acid from that profile and we kind of magnify it, right? And, and that magnification of the right amino acid with the right concentration is stimulatory. That makes sense? Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, And it's important that, like, you know, I mean, amino acids trapped in a bait are not the same as amino acids in the surrounding water. It's very important. If you have a boilie that's got a hard skin on it, the amino acids coming out of that boilie are gonna be kind of impeded, okay? So when I did that um, escort range with Richworth, we, I was very, very specific with them. I said, look, you gotta make a bird food bait. You gotta make a bait that's porous, okay? And then we were able to kind of incorporate in the base mix, the powder itself, the actual meat powder at a certain level, right? <laughs> and over testing, we kind of refined the level and that bait worked absolutely fantastic uh, because it was porous, right? But if you have a kind of a hard shelled bait, you know, it's gonna, it's not gonna leak out as much. It's gonna be reduced. Um, my personal favorite application is a glug. So, I, you know, either a spray or a glug. I, I personally spray hard pellets with a solution and use a PVA bag. That's my standard approach. But if I was gonna use boilies, I'd either rehydrate them with the liquid or I uh, just put a glug on them with the liquid. I'm just going to throw some. I'm totally clutching at a straw here. <laughs> but something you, you said made me think of this. Um, uncoupling proteins. I don't know if you're familiar with those. It, you yeah. said the word uncoupling and it made me think of them. So yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah, you know, nutrition and biology for humans yeah. as a living. It's very, very different from carp. It is, is that something that has any relevance to what you've been saying or, or not? Uh, well, I, I was kind of using the word decoupling in terms of separating. So I was trying to separate the idea that proteins and amino acids trapped in a bait are not stimulatory because they're trapped, whereas ones outside the bait dissolved in the water are. So mm. I'm decoupling two ideas. I, sure, I understand yeah. the decoupling proteins. That's actually a thing in, in biology, right? <laughs> it just happens. I'm using the word in a different context, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's in the the mitochondrial membrane. I believe. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a biologist, but I have lots of biology friends. Right? Yeah, I'm sh I'm sure. Yeah. I just thought I'd throw it there anyway, just just uh, in case. Uh, I gotta say, I mean, I work at a college, and I've kind of my original PhD was not in biochemistry; it was in analytical chemistry. So I'm strong with the mathematics side of it, and fortunately. Right. If Lots of like geneticists and like, you know, cell biologists and microbiologists and all these people I could just say, hey, <laughs> what do you think of this? And th those people actually actually allow me to kind of understand how uh, chemosensory reception works. And then once, uh, once I understood how it works, we were able to kind of make a model which kind of def which explain Maddox's observations, right? So we're working from a, a model and we're working then once we've got a working model, we can say, well, this should work. And then we try it this amino acid with this one should give us a response. And guess what? It's in American terms, we like to say it's batting a thousand, right? It's, it's never been proven wrong so far. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it works much better than trial and error because, you know, if you want to kind of test every single amino acid pair at every concentration range, it's literally more than a thousand separate experiments. So it's, it's, it doesn't work with trial and error. I mean, the chances of someone stumbling across this mixture by accident is pretty remote, to be honest. What else do a carp's chemoreceptors detect apart from amino acids? That's a good question. Uh, there's lots of um, papers out there. I mean, to be honest, my, my whole life has been amino acids to this point, essentially. But I did read a few interesting papers about like zebra fish and bile salts and things like that. So other, basically other excretions from fish, I guess that's what it has in common, right? So if a fish excretes something, it can be detected by chemoreceptors. 
Mm -hmm. uh, primarily, we see these, you know, amino acids as decomposition products coming out of everything. But, you know, poop, basically, right? Bile salts <laughs> come out in poop, right? So, <laughs> you know, so fish can be fish can detect other fish. It's like chemical warfare, right? They're detecting each other by this kind of chemical trail. And uh, I think pheromones too. I think pheromones probably. I'm, you know, I'm I'm just um, throwing that out there. It's, it's nothing. Yeah. I would, uh, but yeah. So th those, you know, if you think about in terms of a chemistry answer, it's small molecules. So if the fish is exuding small molecules, they're generally great kind of lock and key binders, and uh, so they're, they're what can be detected. So, so my question for you to lead down to this, they say if you were to use like a flavor or something that's emitting chemicals and small molecule, uh, molecules, could yeah. that with the, uh, the receptors, could that overload the receptors and then have a negative oh, effect on? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So if I was to, you know, if I was to mix, say my amino acid blend 50, 50 with soy sauce, right. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't work because uh, soy sauce is basically all 20 amino acids in approximately equal amounts. Yeah. The only reason it works is because there's a distinct excess of one or two amino acids. Right. So okay. this is why it doesn't work. You know, on my label, it says do not use in conjunction with any hydrolyzed proteins or anything like that. Because if you have hydrolyzed proteins, you have this big super free amino acids. Right. And the amino acids in, this, in the product would just get like diminished because there'd be a fraction of that then. So, I mean, it's all about selecting one or two at the right ratio and then just magnifying those over the rest. That's how it works. So that the amino acid blends taste good, right? Soy sauce, right? But they emulate. And the reason for that is because if you think about it, if I get like a, you know, a wave of all the amino acids, that's going to hit every single receptor. All the four types of receptor will be filled, right? And, that, and when that happens, it basically shuts down the stimulatory response. But that's okay. If you think about it in nature, if you're at the point where all your receptors are saturated, you're literally right on top of the food. So it kind of makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint for the kind of, the kind of crazy kind of food searching to stop when the fish actually arrives at the food. <laughs> so, you know, I think nature's being clever there, right? And what we do is we uh, kind of, you know, we partially saturate the receptor. So it's always kind of amped, so to speak. That makes sense. Yeah. No, yeah, no, I understand it. I understand it. Um, I do. Um, <clears throat> and another question, which is sort of leading away from this um, sure. re regarding betaine. So oh, I know yeah. a, a lot of our listeners um, are bait makers. Um, and I think <laughs> betaine is something they're all very familiar with. Now, going through your article, you're talking about uh, or your paper, sorry, that you've, you've written, um, betaine having a sort of like a not not a bad response but it wasn't a, certainly wasn't a positive response yeah. um and i was wondering if you could elaborate on that and then maybe Absolutely. sort of ex break down actually what the guys who use betaine maybe how to get the most out of it um and what well, kind of betaine you're talking about there as well because there's various different okay. types. yeah so i got some bad news <laughs> um just last uh just at the end of last year, we actually tested betaine in the lab and we came up with some pretty startling results. Uh, before I give you those results, I'll just say that betaine, either in the HCL form or in the pure form, is used as a baseline stimulant in many, many studies of fish, right? It gives a response, but it's a minimal response. And that's kind of like a minimal response they compare against, yeah? It turns out that literally every amino acid, apart from the ones which are repulsive, and there's only two of those, right? every single one is stronger and more attractive than betaine, okay? And the reason is, is because betaine is essentially glycine. Glycine is a medium attractive amino acid, but it's had its, um, oh, just step back a second. So amino acids are so called because one end of the molecule has an acid group and one end has a, an amino group, hence an amino acid, right? It turns out that the amino end of the betaine has been enlarged essentially. I won't get into the details there, but it's not the same size and shape as any other amino acid. That means it doesn't fit the key as well. Sorry, it doesn't fit the lock as well. So think of betaine as a key and the receptor as a lock. So it's a poor fit. Now, what does that mean? It means that you've got to have a super high concentration of betaine to have a stimulatory effect, which is fine because we already mentioned it, right? Anglers, people generally are heavy handed, yeah? I mean, 
to me, a teaspoon in a liter is way too much for amino acids, right? People out there are putting like tablespoons in, right? You've seen it, yeah? And betaine's the only one where you can literally put as much in as you want and it doesn't matter because it's such a poor fit. It's such a low stimulatory effect. You can put as much as you want, right? And the, the result of that is, is that at high concentrations, you get a very, very mild stimulation, okay? Which seems to work, okay? If you want a very mild stimulation and you want to put a lot of betaine in, that's what you'll get. However, that pales in insignificance to actually stimulatory amino acids, which at the right concentration are much better stimulants, okay? So I don't use betaine at all in, as a stimulatory amino acid in any of my products, okay? Because it's just, frankly, not very good. <laughs> but again, at high concentrations, it gives them, you know, minimal response. Now, back to, the, back to what we did in the lab. So I didn't know this until <laughs> the end of last year where we, we do what we call um, titrations. What does that mean? So we have a 144 gallon fish tank and we squirt in 50 milliliters of amino acid at a certain strength. And then we can work out the actual concentration in the tank. So we work out the ambient concentration in the tank, the average concentration, if you like, and we just record the fish's behavior. And, uh, you know, so for the stimulatory amino acids, we're getting like really, really low concentrations of having a really good effect on the fish. And then we try betaine, put it in, next one, put it in, next one, put it in, next one. And we got up to like literally, you know, a pound of betaine in the fish tank and they were just about <laughs> getting stimulated, which was not good, okay? So the side effect of that, and you kind of mentioned it too, is also the type of betaine because there's betaine molecule itself and then there's betaine HCL. Now, what's HCL? Well, that's called an acid salt, right? So if you take a volatile kind of unstable organic molecule and you add HCL to it, it forms a salt, which is shelf stable, lasts a long time, and it's much better. So if you look at literally any drug on the shelf down, down at the chemist or the pharmacist here in the US, it will say something drug name, HCL. That means they turned it into a crystal. It's, it's more shelf stable. The side effect of that is with betaine HCL, when you dissolve it, the HCL comes off, right? And it makes it extremely acidic. So the fish, when we got up to literally the pH of vinegar, <laughs> right? We're starting to show signs of distress. So betaine in the HCL form under very high concentrations is not good for fish because yeah, it's very acidic. And that's is that and it's actually betaine HCL is sold as um, for people, older people who suffer with low stomach acid levels, they have bad indigestion and stuff like that. Betaine is that betaine HCL rather is actually prescribed to them as a dietary supplement. So to help them generate or kind of put extra HCL in their stomach to dissolve food. Uh, but natural betaine, natural betaine is much better. I haven't tested that one, but you wouldn't have the acidic problem there. But the problem with that is it's volatile and organic, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's going to have a lesser shelf life. And it's, you know, if you've ever, I mean, I got some betaine in the, in the basement from years and years ago. And, you know, I take the lid off and it smells that ammonia-y kind of smell. Yeah. Right? You mentioned, I mentioned that amino group with those bits hanging on it. Those start to fall off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> those are the things you smell. Yeah. So, I mean, betaine, it's, it's certainly very user friendly. You can use as much as you want and it'd be okay. But in terms of generating an appropriate stimulatory response, it's not good at all. Ken Townley ain't going to be happy with you. No, they're not. And, and, and it's, it's great because I actually have a video of that, right? It's, it's going to go up. Uh, I haven't put it up yet. It's going to go up on my uh, YouTube pretty soon, but um, it'll go up there and people can see for themselves that I'm not making this stuff up. Right. And this is, you know, and I don't want to kind of ruffle any feathers because, you know, there's a lot of money involved in selling betaine products. Um, but, you know, show me the video. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, no, really appreciate it. J just for people that are listening and perhaps want to kind of follow along to what we're saying and chase up the things that you're saying. What is your um? How, how do people find your YouTube videos? What's the name of your channel? Okay, so <laughs> I just recently uh, started a, a YouTube channel called Carp Geek TV. <laughs> yeah, so. Carp Geek TV. Yeah, so I mean, I got probably seven or eight videos up there, including um, trials of the bait and like some theoretical stuff. If people want to contact me, I think my contact details are up. That's probably the best way to get hold of me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm putting that. My next, it's kind of interesting. My next project because I'm totally, uh, you know, nerd, right, or geek. And uh, my next thing is I'm actually. I, I always had this curious question: What does lit shot actually weigh? <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm actually going to go out and weigh all the split shot and all the all the swivels and things like that, and find out, you know, to like three decimal places in grams what they actually weigh. So, so it's just something that keeps me <laughs> curiosity, right? So, and and that's that's the kind of basis of your channel, is it? That kind of thing. Yeah. So nerdy stuff. So there's bait. Yeah. There's the bait side. There's the cameras. I do a lot of camera stuff, and then there's you know kind of nerdy little. Uh, but detail, it's more, that's not really a main focus. That's just a, nerd, a nerdy little, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I got like a, you know, I got two submarines. I use mini subs to go chase fish around. I got like a bunch of different cameras. I use There's a lot of underwater stuff on there. All there will be. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to come on to that. Um, definitely want to talk to you about your, your mini submarines case sound amazing, but, but I mean, let, let, let's just stick with amino mass. Um, sorry. Amino acids just for the minute. Um, something you you went back to very early on in this interview, um, and some that that, that we we'd all have, have read. You said um, when you were quoting Kevin Maddox that mm. carp have an involuntary feeding response. Well, I don't think he used those words exactly, but he's. I'm just looking at his book right now, and he's got. I'm looking at page 201 tank tank test results, and he, and his very good reaction was classified as immediate response by the fish fish rolling on the gravel and against the side of the tank, mouthing gravel, digging the gravel. So that analogous response is what we call, and I got, you know, if you want to check out the, the YouTube, we've got video of that happening, and that's what we call it, the involuntary phase. Okay? Yeah. See, see I want to, I'm skeptical of the, the involuntary bit. How involuntary do you feel that really is? Uh, yeah, this is, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, a word that evokes a res- like an emotional response, right? Yeah. Um, but it truly is involuntary because they're literally eating gravel when there's no food there, right? So they're eating, they're exhibiting a feeding behavior with no food present, right? I wouldn't know how else to describe it other than involuntary feeding response. That's when they're kind of literally tails up, vertical in the water, heads down eating gravel, right? And I uh, think mm. because they go through... Um, three phases of stimulation, right? So initially when there's no amino acid, they're just normal, right, of course. And then they get like a, a certain threshold reached and they start to search. So the searching behavior is actually the one to one, right? Because they're not going crazy, right? So they're actively searching for food and kind of gently mouthing the bottom, right? So they're not going crazy. Then if you add slightly more amino acid, they tip up, go tails up, literally start digging a hole to China at that point, <laughs> right? And it, it gets pretty intense sometimes, but that is a very, very narrow range of concentration when it transitions through there, right? And after um, what we call involuntary stimulation, they just shut down. If you put too much in, they just overload. It's like 20 cups of coffee and they just shut down. So it's all about maintaining that very narrow window. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, involuntary feeding response, it's a bit grandiose, but uh, <laughs> if you watch if you look at the video, it does kind of look like that. <laughs> so. So like something we we discuss a lot, and I know me and Sam um, are confident in, and we use them in our baits, are essential oils. Yes. Um, yes. And I was wondering if you could maybe expand a bit on why essential oils are attractive, and would it be because of like an amino acid content within them? Uh, well, <laughs> I think, you know, this is personal opinion. I don't think I'm in the realm of amino acids anymore, so I'm offering an opinion. Yeah. Um, I mean, I actually, after your last, uh, well, not your last one, but after the, I listened to your uh, interview with Dean and uh, Dean was talking about orange essential oil. And I was literally minimizing the the window and looking on Amazon for (laughs) orange oil, right? Or Mandarin, Mm. because I think, you know, I I think what um, we need to look for in a flavor is a natural flavor because, um, you know, these, these synthetic flavors, they do give this kind of nasty aftertaste sometimes. And uh, that's something I think we need to avoid. So I think the more natural the flavor, the better. So essential oils are literally the essence of the flavor, right? That's where all the flavor molecules are in that oil. So you're, you're literally, you know, taking nature's flavor in a very concentrated form when you buy an oil. And uh, so that's why, you know, I'm, I'm personally this year, you know, when I make some bait, I'm going to utilize essential oils more, particularly after listening to Dean and his uh, mandarin oil, I believe it was, which I just purchased. So yeah. Mm. So- your favorite oils to use i'm just asking for a friend <laughs> <laughs> the uh I, I so when we did that interview of dean obviously i bought some some of the orange oil that he mentioned the sweet orange oil uh yeah. and did tests on that the i also te- i tested several different well many different uh citric um 
uh, based ones. And uh, the the tangerine for me, just by my tests in my uh, yeah. my pond, is yeah. uh, they take some beating. There are yeah. some essential oils that that are more attractive in in my experience. I'm not going to mention them because uh, we, we're going to produce a bait with them in. But yeah, the the <laughs> the orange oil was very very good, but the tangerine oil that I tested was was also right. absolutely fantastic. Um, interestingly enough, now that the water temperature certainly over here is is um, obviously dropped significantly uh, since that that first interview with Dean, which I think was summertime. Um, there's definitely been a shift. So I think that's something that's fascinating. I know mm. we're going off subject here, but the te the water temperature and how I think it's presumably more how the essential oils interact with the water and the surroundings. Maybe it's partially due to the, the carps, uh, chemo reception apparatus. Maybe that yeah. changes. Um, I, th I think that, ability, yeah, sorry, go on. If anything increases with temperature, so you're going to get a higher kind of leak rate and a higher yeah. version rate when it's warmer. Yeah. And will congeal a little bit when it gets cold so mm. it'll be a limiting factor too but I, I must state before we go on that um i don't think amino acids are really present to any great degree in an essential oil and i think it's a it's literally a taste and smell like we have right it's not hemosensory receptor so i think those those very kind of aromatic kind of delicate flavors are like much larger, more complex molecules, which aren't just, which are detected by taste and smell receptors, not chemo receptors. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Like, cool. And another one, if you're, if you're testing oils and you want to use them in your bait, which is a well-known yes. one, but one which I've been used for years and years, I know Sam has, is uh, black pepper oil as well. Oh, I got some of that. Yeah. I got some of that um, many years ago. I think I, I got the book here actually. It is. I've got sitting next to me on the sofa keeping, Carp fever company is the BK Guide to Carp Baits with Ken Pat. <laughs> Good old Ken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I like, I like that one a lot. And uh, he talks about betaine in there a little bit too, which is interesting. But um, he loves it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because there is a chapter in there where he, where he catches a lot of fish one time on betaine, but never seems, you know, he wasn't able to repeat it, which kind of tells you that that whole window thing is possible. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever looked into DMPT? I have not. I've heard of it, but it's kind of a new thing, right? So, yeah, I, I'm not a chemist by any means, and yeah. my university days are long behind me, and I don't practice any sort of science or pay much attention to it apart from my bait talks. Uh, but it's a metabolite, if I believe. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. No, so honestly, I mean, I, I I did read one article on it and how it was, um, you know, it was a I think it's a Chinese article or something. They were using it as in fish farms in China or something, something like that. Probably where people got the idea from. But uh, you know, that's it's not an amino acid. So again, sound like a broken record, but not really my area of expertise. I mean, to, to talking about amino acids, obviously that is your area of expertise. Yeah. Do do you? I mean, and perhaps you're going to be. You can't how it be slightly biased because obviously that's all you focus on. But do yeah. you feel amino acids or, or amino acid blends are as good as it can possibly get in terms of attraction for carp? Or no. do you feel <laughs> that aminos mixed with, say, organic acids or, or something else are the yeah, ultimate yeah. way to go? So, you know, it's all part of the same attractive package. I think the key thing is package. We talked about it a little bit earlier that if we use a flavor in combination with a particular amino acid blend, that's probably the best way to go. So, I mean, the, the perfect bait attractor package for me is a simple one. It's like, you know, just the flavor of your choice with some glycerol and some amino acid solution glugged around your pellets or boilie, okay? And then the boilie itself or the pellets themselves have those encapsulated amino acids, which are part of the protein, which form part of the profile for the food. So it's like church and state, right? What happens in stays in the boilie right <laughs> what happens in the glug stays in the glug or actually disperses into the pond so i mean i mean i'm all about the attractor package i'm not really you know into nutrition and in fact one of my um goals um when i first got into this was to um kind of amp up the attractiveness of kind of low food quality baits not for fishing but for the aquaculture industry so the idea was at the time that you know if we can use cheaper ingredients to make cheaper pellets to feed you know fish in fish farms then that's kind of a more profitable way to go. But the fish, you know, they won't eat bone meal, right? But how do you make bone meal? You make it kind of attractive with amino acids. We haven't really pursued that too much because we kind of took off with the Asian carp project. 
Um, but, you know, aquaculture, you know, fish farming is an area where, you know, you can basically ramp up the effectiveness of a poor food quality bait and it'll get eaten kind of just as much as a good bait at that point. And then if you think in fishing terms, well, if I have a good bait and I add the amino acid attracted to it, it's even better. So uh, that's kind of where we are. I mean, I'm, I'm completely on the attractor side. I, I'm not about designing baits, except the porosity of baits when I need to, you know, encapsulate amino acids in the bait and then, and then they come out. Yeah, and I mean, I appreciate it's not your area of expertise, but you prefer a, a flavor on a glycerol base, do you? Uh, well, I don't choose the, the glycerol, glycerol, other than the fact that it's kind of uh, fiscus, <laughs> right? So it just sticks to the bait. It's really a carrier. I'm not really interested in its properties other than the fact that it's a carrier. Right. Yeah. I do like the fact that it's a, kind of slightly sweet. And I do actually believe it or not, I, you know, I'm, I'm, this is something I'm getting into now. It's like I'm trying to kind of cut any kind of preserve out of the bait and a way to go with that is to use kind of natural kind of sugars like honey for example right mm. and honey does not ever go off because it's super 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 concentrated in sugar right and you know it, it never kind of goes off because there's just not literally enough free water to the for the bugs to swim around in so they can't eat the sugar right <laughs> and that's you know uh, that's exactly how, like, for example, when you add salt to water to make it PVA friendly or whatever, if you've got some particles or something, it's exactly what happens there. So if you put some kind of salt, some kind of sugar, even anything that dissolves in water, when you saturate that solution and make it as much dissolved as possible, there's literally no water left to dissolve other things. So the bacteria can't even get started. So I may actually start using some really gooey kind of... Um, Ever, do you ever have uh, baklava, that kind of Greek kind of pastry? Oh, I love yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Nut, I'm, I'm, I'm making a, uh, like a fruit and nut kind of boily or baklava boily. That's my next project. So <laughs> the great forest, right, and held together literally with honey, right? And because, you know, fishing here in the States, I mean, if you don't catch a cup in 10 minutes, you're doing something wrong, right? So, so lucky me, right? So I can have a very kind of like soft bait and I, you know, I can cast a new bait out every 15, 20 minutes if I want to. So this, this will be kind of a soft boil that's very porous and mm. that shit will just kind of ooze out of it and in there because, you know, I can suspend the particles of amino acid because, um, you know, they'll, they'll be kind of trapped in that sugar solution there. Yeah, interesting. You re I mean, you mentioned the sugars. Obviously, aminos are your thing. How do you rate lipids and, and carbohydrates on on the the totem pole um, of <laughs> uh, of what carp find attractive and what they need for for you know to to thrive? Uh, in terms of you know nutrition, I mean, I think there's you know there's a lot you know I mean you you mentioned HNV and then you know you're gonna <laughs> like politics, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Piss off half the people immediately, right? But my take on HNV is that. Um, I think it's a lot simpler than people think. As long as the fish have access to, you know, a good range of foods, a balanced diet, so to speak, then, you know, they're going to be fine. And if you, I think this research has already been done. I mean, if you look at fish farms, they feed the fish pellets, right? Those pellets are specifically designed to cause the fish to grow, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, if you look at the, the protein, fats, and carbs in a, a carp pellet, I'm, I'm sure that's pretty close to where you want to be with a bait. Um, sure. I mean, will fish eat them? Yes. But will they eat other baits preferentially? Yes. I mean, think of a buffet, right? When you go to the buffet, you know, the salad's good for you, but you don't come back to the table with a salad, do you? <laughs> right. So given the choice, I think carp will necessarily go for the more calorific kind of, uh, foods because I think because as animals, I mean, humans, bears, whatever, right. You look at a bear, right. I'm going off track here. Look at a bear, right. In seasons of plenty, what does a bear do in the river when it grabs a salmon? it bites its head off and it eats the brain, right? And that's all it eats. It throws the rest of the fish back in the river, right? Because the brain has the most fat, okay? So I think we're designed to kind of consume as many calories as possible, and that's mostly containing fat and meat, okay? And then store them, right? Because we're, you know, we're not designed to eat four times a day. Back in the day when we were hunter-gatherers, we'd eat maybe once every three days, right? So we feast and famine, feast and famine. I think natural situation is like that too. You know, as soon as a bunch of bloodworm come in, gorge, 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 right? And then maybe it might go a while without some food. So I'm of the opinion that um, fish, people, every animal is designed to consume as many calories as possible and then save them for a rainy day. Unfortunately, when we're fishing, that rainy day never happens. They get high calorie baits of their choice every day. Like some of these fish, you know, with the big bellies, you've seen them right there's rumors that fish are getting diabetes and all this right it's like crazy stuff 
<laughs> that's my take on it. Do I have any kind of nutritional advice? No, that's it. I, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not a nutritionist. I'm just saying, you know, if you give them a, a Sunday dinner, they'll eat a Sunday dinner, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. Know, what would you choose, right? <laughs> yeah, and I respect that. I, I, I had to ask. I had to ask. Yeah. No, I'm I mean, sure the listeners a, would, yeah. would want to ask as well. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. It's an interesting topic, don't get me wrong. But I, I think, honestly, there's a little bit um, too much uh, that goes into this. Like, you know, I, I read articles on the internet and like forums and stuff and people are posting the amino acid of their bait profile you know the profile of the amino acids in their bait and then it's like you know one percent off over here one percent off over there and i don't really matter yeah yeah no 100 percent, 100 percent. i do agree i do agree so i mean th- this j- just to kind of go back over this amino acid product that, mm. that you that you produce by the sounds of it um yeah and you've obviously got a lot of confidence in Am I have I got this right? So right, it's a blend of two amino acids. Yeah, right amongst them. Yeah, things. so so yeah. It, and is it? It's not the two most attractive amino acids you can find. It's the most. It, it it's it's the most blended with a lesser attractive amino acid, which basically balances it out for a longer term attraction. Is that yeah. So right? if I'm going to give you the just go back to what we said earlier, there's those four different classes of amino acid, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, and of those, only two are really relevant in stimulation, the basic ones and the neutral ones, okay? And this is kind of a, I'm giving a bit of a game away here. I haven't actually drunk any beer yet, but I'm giving it away, right? But, Why not? Uh, Get drinking. Mix a, a really attractive one from one column with a really unattractive one from the other column. You get an attenuation. So it's like, um, you know, the really, the really stimulatory one will give you like a plus 10 or something on the scale, right? And the weaker one will give you maybe a minus four because they act in opposite directions. Mm. Get like a constant six. So that's what widens the window stimulation. Yeah. So by making these binary mixtures, I'm able to um, prolong the effect or make the window of concentration wider. Yeah. So, so f- for me, if I was to say, okay, like I, I want to use this kind of product in, in a, mm. a, a boilie I was making yeah. or um, or even to, to use it on a, a boilie that I've already bought, you know, add it after as a soak, etc. Yeah. What, because something that you've been very, very vocal about is the window where the mm. balance of the amino the acid concentration, that's yeah. the paramount importance. So yeah. it fries my brain a little bit that we'd have to be so reliant upon the concentration being just yeah. right. Yeah. How do you how how do you translate that into a, a, a functional bait that you're casting yeah. out? You don't so, know when the, the carp's going to swim yeah. by, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I'll tell you how it works um, in practice. Uh, in practice, I use, um, you know, a bag of pellets and I just spray them, right? And that puts the right amount in the water. And you got to remember there's a source in the sink, right? So the source of the bait goes in, it's the pellets, yeah? And then the fish come along and eat the pellets. <laughs> and then that amino acid goes away, right? And it gets washed away just through, you know, the natural movement of the water. And then, you know, you catch a fish and the next one goes in. So it's really, really suited to little and often feeding, right? So this is why, that's why the original product worked really great for match fishing when there was that very narrow window for that first product. Mm. The second and third products where we have that second amino acid with a broader window, you can be a bit more heavy handed, right? So you can, you know, put a bit more bait in and it'll still be fine. And I've worked out a bunch of different... Um, dosing protocols so when folks buy the product there's actually a barcode on the back and they just you know scan it with their phone you know how you go into a restaurant these days and you use your phone to get the menu off the barcode that's what we do here in the states anyway so you do that no <laughs> you ever no. done no you don't do that there no no okay okay so like restaurants are still open here but we're contact free i'm sidetracking right so you can't be handed a real menu and oh do- yes no i'm sorry yes i have yeah. done that yeah yeah. The yeah qr yeah. code yeah the square yes QR. i know what you mean yeah 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 so that you know you just click the qr code and up pops uh, the pdf with the uh, with the with the recipe basically so it tells you how much to add and you know don't exceed this and um it seems to work you know for the for the applications we have there so method feeder works really really well bags of pellets work really well Glug actually works really well as long as you don't throw in the world supply of boilies. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the, the fact that we've, you know, we've got that window now with this third generation product kind of helps us out there. Yeah. See, I mean, I appreciate, as you said, 
uh, where you're fishing it, it it's you're getting a fish every chuck yeah. aren't you? For, for, almost for, yeah yeah so my winter water um there's only been one fish out all winter um since the beginning of november there's literally been one carp come out so trying to time that di difficult you know yeah it is so what you do there it's um it's what we did with rich Rook with the s core range you make boilies which are porous and then you actually encapsulate the amino acid actually blend as a powder into the boilie. So we supplied them with the powder, they put it in their base mix and it was a porous bird food boilie, okay? You can, because the liquid is super, super concentrated, it's literally as strong as I can get it. You can put, you know, the recommended amount into your base mix when you're mixing it up and it all kind of, and what happens is when you dry the boilie, because amino acids are powders when you start, right? They're salts essentially. And then you dissolve them and they kind of disappear. They get into the solution. And then when you, it's like, it's like salt water or sugar water, right? As soon as the water is driven off, they recrystallize, right? So inside a dried boilie, an escort boilie would be like little tiny particles of uh, kind of solid amino acid ready to kind of dissolve and leak out as soon as you throw it in the water. So that's great because it's the whole shelf life thing. So you can actually dry the boilies out and store them in a bag. And this is, we worked a long time on that. And then, you know, the water leaks in because it's porous and then they slowly leak out. Okay. And uh, it's interesting because um, we got that porous porosity just right where the fish in one instance is anecdotal. I was told this by one of the testers. They'd come in, they'd bait a spot, catch a bunch of fish and then come back literally two days later and the carp will still be grubbing around in the gravel there and they, they wouldn't have moved from the spot even though the baits are gone. And the reason is that the amino acids themselves are denser than water are the solutions at least. And what happens is the amino acids come out and they kind of seep into the gravel and um, you know, they, they, they percolate out over time. So the fish just keep coming back and back. So it's not just that the amino acids <clears throat> get into the water and just move off away from the bait. They also get into the lake bed and create like a, a zone, which is kind of interesting. And I've actually seen this in the fish tank. I, uh, one time I was actually out testing a bait and I, you know, I do um, porous pellets. That's my preferred way to test the bait. I soak pellets in the solution that like tiny little sponges, which, which works great. And I got back, I had a couple of pellets left in my bag. Oh, I'll just feed the fish, you know. And I threw literally two pellets in the fish tank with the carp in there. And it just swam over and at them right away. Oh, that's interesting. And then I, then I went, to, you know, went, went about my day. Came back literally a few hours later. And the carp, where the pellets had landed in the fish tank, was literally digging a hole, right? So the, the stuff had seeped out of the pellet into the gravel. And then the fish had come back over there and was trying to dig around to find more food. So it's, you know, the fact that they're denser than water means they literally just get into the gravel and they kind of make an area, which is kind of nice. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> that's, that's what you want, isn't it? You know, that, that competition for food and the prolonged yeah. looking for food. Because, I mean, it, it, yeah. you, and perhaps we can lead on to this now. You've obviously watched Carp Underwater. The, unfortunately, as, as shit hot as we think our rigs are, they do get picked up and spat. Oh, out. yeah. Um, and anyone that's watched fish from you know a tree feed, we all know this. Um, obviously, we we take measures to minimise that in terms of rig mechanics, etc. Um, you've obviously you've got a mini submarine, right? I actually have two mini submarines. <laughs> two mini submarines. So yeah. Tell us about that side of things. Okay, so um, with this work with the, the U.S. government, when I'm tracking these Asian carp. Our original plan was to attract them to an area with the products we've been talking about. But, you know, how do you know they're there, right? So we thought, well, you know, we've got to go down and take a look. So we actually bought a couple of, they're called like, you know, they're called uh, remotely operated vehicles, ROVs. They are submarines, um, but they're like remote control boats, essentially, that go underwater. Um, we got two. One's called a Gladius Mini. And at the website, uh, rather the YouTube site, like I uh, took it out recently, got some really good footage. It's up there. People can take a look. And the other one is called a, a Meter, which it's another brand. It's very similar. The only difference is the, the Gladius has a tether. So you're kind of feeding a line out to the submarine the whole time. And there's a danger of entanglement and you can only go out 100 feet, all this business, right? Because radio waves don't go underwater. So there's no such thing as a remote control submarine, right? However, this one that just came out is awesome because it has um, a tether buoy, right? So the there's a float, literally, it's like a really big pike float with like uh, all the like 10 feet of or 20 feet of um, cable around it. You let that 20 feet of cable out and the, and the submarine can go down 20 feet. And this radio antenna float just sits there. 
and that transmits back to shore, right? So you can actually use that almost like a marker float. So you can follow the submarine with this float on the surface, which is pretty awesome. Wow. I'm gonna, you know, that's still in the box, actually. I only got it a couple of months ago. I'm going to crank that one out. And that's the one I'm going to use when I do my camera work because I'm going to get a lot of uh, video this year. I've got all these different cameras on sticks and on poles and all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to feed, you know, certain spots and watch the fish's behavior there. And, um, you know, I'll sneak up on them with the submarine and uh, <laughs> see what happens. But it's, it's interesting. You think, oh, the fish are scared of it, but they're not. No, I was just going to say, have you found them to be quite curious? Well, it's interesting because I'm a scuba diver. And uh, on an open circuit scuba diver rig, you're breathing out uh, bubbles the whole time. And that's really, really noisy, right? If you ever watch a scuba diver video, you can hear the kind of the Darth Vader noise of the voice. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how Darth Vader was cast, right, with the scuba gear, right? <laughs> and... Uh, so that scares fish, right? I mean, some curious fish will come over to you, but um, most fish just move away from the noise, right? Um, so if you ever want to sneak up on a fish as a scuba diver, you have to use what's called a rebreather, which is kind of a, it doesn't make any bubbles essentially. And that's what a lot of the naturalists do. You know, you see these like really brilliant movies of underwater mm. videos and they're down there with a rebreather at that point. Jeremy Wade, if you ever watched Jeremy Wade in those, some of those uh, shows he did, um, he was on a rebreather in some of those. Anyway, so... I can't afford a rebreather. They're like $8,000. <laughs> right? uh, so I went submarine, right? So the submarine is silent and it's, you know, like $1,000 maybe. And uh, it doesn't scare the fish because it doesn't make a noise. And they come right up to it. And as long as you don't turn the lights on full, you know, I can get away with like half volley, uh, volume, half intensity on the lights. And, uh, you know, it, it just works perfect. And what I like to do with it, I like to... Um, <sighs> There's one where you have a tilt function, so you can tilt the submarine at 45 degrees, but still continue kind of flat, if that makes sense, at a certain depth. So you can lock a depth like three feet off the bottom, turn it 45 degrees, and you can basically look down and look for your rig. Wow. <laughs> so so I, I send the bait boat out, right? <laughs> Drop the bait. And then I, I send the submarine out to check what the rig looks like. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Stop it. That's too, yeah, that's I used to... Much. um. I, it's kind of crazy because I'm obsessed with um, bottom topography, right? And I don't want my rig to land bad. I don't want it to land it in a weed, <laughs> you know. So I'm obsessed with what the bottom looks like where I'm fishing, right? So what I used to do, I used to use my bait boat with one of those um, fish spy cameras. You've seen those things, the marker float with the camera in it. Mm. Yeah. So I put that actually in the in the hopper with the bait, and then and then I just reel it down to the bottom and see what was going on. And that's kind of a poor man's way to do it. Then I tried the winch cam on the bait boat and you get the dreaded spin, right? <laughs> and it was just, I was getting vertical watching that thing. That was, and, and you know, I'm not a big fan of winch cameras. And so what I ended up doing was getting these submarines where I can literally drive it out there <laughs> and just look. <laughs> so, How does the transmission work on the video? So like you say, like the fish spy um, yeah. and obviously the submarine, because I mean, I've used, I bought a GoPro years ago and I thought yeah, it's yeah. going to be great. It's got Wi-Fi. I'll be able to like sort of like drop it on the spot, watch fish feed. I thought it'd be a real <clears throat> yeah, insightful it's awesome. thing, but the Wi-Fi doesn't transmit through water. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of um, the ginger fisherman. I don't know if you've seen him on YouTube. He basically no. GoPro and he goes to his local stream and he gets like a barbel taken on camera and stuff. It's awesome, right? He's fishing, but he's fishing like a two foot deep stream that's gym clear and you can just wait out place the camera and fish in front of it right mm. so he's not controlling the camera or seeing what's going on he can actually see the camera in the water okay and you're right uh, wi-fi does not go through water how do you get around that well the, the submarine works because it has an actual physical cable that goes to the submarine right and that okay the shore that's with the gladius the first one we've got and then the second one with the float right it can transmit through air so there's a base station a wi-fi hotspot essentially built into a float <laughs> And that, and that transmits back to the shore. And that's the same method the uh, fish fly camera uses. So you can set the fish fly camera up, and it's, as long as it's not submerged, you can get a live shot, right? But it's usually too deep. You can't see the bottom with the live shot on the fish fly camera. So you press the record button. You reel it down to the bottom like it's a, a marker float. And I kind of stop mine about six inches off the bottom, let it sit there for 30 seconds, and then let it back up. And then it reconnects. And then I can just watch the recorded video of what happened underwater. So it's not live. The, the camera is not great for live viewing on this mm -hmm. camera, but it is great for survey, right? But the submarine beats them all because it gives you the live shot, right, <laughs> of what's going on. 
you were saying that like, you use the lights on um sort of like a half dim do you find the lights of spooking fish or only only if they're intense yeah they don't like they don't like them when they're dazzled so to speak it's a bit like when you go down a, like a road at night and someone doesn't dim their lights you know yeah 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 no uh, it's, to be it's honest, just... I, never, I never use it i i tend i'm lucky i i got a really clear gravel pit as my local kind of fishery mm-hmm. the clarity is excellent so I, I never really need lights yeah no nice it's, it's just something we've debated uh, yeah. on the podcast well it's interesting because lights have sometimes attract fish i mean squid right i mean the, the squid boat will put loads of lights out and bring the squid to the surface and they'll net them so some fish or some aquatic creatures like lights and don't it's like i say it's, it's something we've uh, we've debated numerous times um going back to the amino acids now i'm just purely asking this from a selfish point of view uh, <laughs> a can you have items. some yes ah oh, perfect <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, actually, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, you know we're, I got a couple of friends in the UK and uh, they just bought this. I don't, I don't know if it's been out a while here, but they got this one rate shipping box now where it's forty dollars, and I can squeeze maybe three bottles in that. So <laughs> you know, so I can uh, I can supply my uh, friends and family if you wish, and uh, you know, friendly podcast producers for some. <laughs> Oh, that's honestly, yeah, no, really kind of wasn't what I was going to ask, to be honest, but I'll absolutely take it, take you up on it. And I'm sure Sam will. Um, but no, thank you. Um, what I was going to talk about is, is just a couple of amino acids I've played with in their sort of mm-hmm. like pure form. And I've, I've yeah. bought them in their powder form in the past. Um, one of them being lysine, which I have a sneaky suspicion might be one of the ones that you're using. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Uh, in your products and another one which i've used um and I actually brought it up on the last podcast that we recorded i don't think it's been released yet um was something i've played around with years gone by was taurine which i had um, yeah, yeah. interesting results with i don't know if that's something yeah. you can taurine um taurine's not a true amino acid it's one of the one of the uh special so to speak it's like a, betaine yeah it's a bit of a betaine situation yeah mm-hmm I mean, um, lysine, it's not a secret, right? I mean, you look, you look at Kevin Maddox's book, 1983, lysine, valine are the two most potent amino acids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, it must be stated that the difference between, you know, league one, league two, and league three in amino acids is literally nothing in terms of concentration. So you can literally use any of them. And I'm going to give you a little hint here. The, the ones I tend to choose are the ones that have the highest solubility. Because okay. The solution, right? Yeah, I got to yeah. get as much amino acid into the water as I can in a small package um so i tend to use the more soluble ones and uh, you know without <laughs> disclosing any ip that's probably as much as i can say so yeah but you can just look at it just, just google like you know amino acid solubilities and you can just pick any of the big ones there yeah interesting no and i'm, I'm sure our listeners they'll, they'll appreciate little bits like that yeah yeah but don't use too much that's the problem right <laughs> well again sort of like um i guess each uh, i've individual amino acids do they vary hugely um yeah. if somebody wanted to make say a solution with one amino acid which they're they're going to add to their glug or something what would you sort of like a recommend a starting point for people to be because obviously a lot of people are really including probably too much what should people be looking looking toward um i recommend no more than 0.5 percent by weight okay so that's per powdered form to weight by water yeah, well, per liter or per kilo, because a liter weighs a kilo. So yeah, yeah. If you're looking at five grams. Well, it depends on the amino acid, but between one and ten uh, grams per kilo would be the one. Yeah, so it's as little as that. I mean, honestly, it's it's kind of an interesting thing because we have this order of magnitude issue where the window is right. So it's like the difference between one drop and ten drops, right? Or the difference between ten drops and a hundred drops mm-hmm. in a liter, right? <laughs> so you're like, you know, you're you're at a very very low concentration. And then you're taking that concentration and multiplying or dividing it by 10, and it's still virtually nothing. Uh, and that's why it's been such a problem, because people can't really get their head around the idea that you're so low concentration, and it's a very narrow concentration window down there, mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to get your head around. So like people like to think, oh, it's a teaspoon. No, no, no. It's, it's literally <laughs> a couple of grains, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, no, it's it's, uh, it's interesting. It's fascinating, and I think it's a, yeah. a lot of craze, especially in the UK carp scene, with the high attract hook baits um, yeah. in winter, and it's sort of like complete role reversal. But it, it makes perfect sense, and it's it's nice to hear it from somebody who's yeah. studied it at great length. Yeah, I would say if there's any kind of take home message with amino acids, less is more. 
start low and go high, not go high and go low. It's just, it's just silly. So if you think that's not very much, divide that number by 10 and start there. Nice. Is it something you've tested much on your fish, Sam? Um, <clears throat> not singular amino acids. No, no. I mean, I've, obviously I've tested amino acid rich um, hydrolysates and, uh, and other things, but no, I haven't gone down the single amino route. I mean, yeah. it's something that always concerns me is exactly what i said before is the 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 fact that they're 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 kind of they're there and gone in in the blink of an eye aren't they um so the window for opportunity for really optimizing amino acid attraction it for me and 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 my knowledge and what i've done is so small it's always left me looking at other areas if that makes sense yeah absolutely makes sense yeah i mean the the trick is again if you're you know, going to use a boilie as the poorest boilie approach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you, we, what we did with Richworth was we kind of overloaded the beyond, you know, obviously much beyond 0.5%. And because we were able to kind of couple that with the kind of flux rate coming out of the poorest boilie, it lasted for like, it lasted a long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think the other thing as well for me is, is, I mean, I'm very interested to try your products. It, it does sound fantastic. <clears throat> and having spoke to you before, I mean, I can tell it is potentially a huge edge edge for people. Um, yeah. Something else for me, and I, I think I probably mentioned this on every podcast at the minute, but <laughs> I always think about, you know, when it comes to attraction, it's that, again, like you said, it's that t- typical human thing. Oh, well, more is better. So if, if, yeah. we, if we thought of, you know, we're lighting up, light bulbs in the carp's brain are mm. more light bulbs lit up better or does that come no. up where it's too much do we want them to detect citric acid lysine blah blah, blah. do we want all of that going on at once is that the ultimate or actually do we need to back off from that and just select which light bulbs we light up in the carp's brain figuratively it's, it's, speaking, of course. I, I love your question it's a very good question um Flavors, right? We think of flavor, it's a bit like a chord in music, right? You combine a couple of notes, you get a chord, right? So we can, you know, what's the classic Chinese dish? Sweet and sour, right? Mm. It's not sweet, it's not sour, it's both. And we love the taste of sweet and sour because we can kind of assimilate those two flavors simultaneously, yeah? So for like kind of, if you like traditional smells, you know, like perfumes have many notes, right? So traditional smells, traditional flavors, you can combine as many as you want because we the apparatus. But it goes back to that whole very simple chemosensory receptor. Yeah, the chemosensory receptor is very, very simple. It just detects, you know, two amino acids, right? Or two classes of amino acid. So you can literally, if you want to go with your light bulb situation, you can have as many light bulbs as you want, but one of them has to be red. <laughs> and that's the amino acid light bulb. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. Because the flavor and smell is, is you know, hitting those traditional taste receptors, right? Which are far more sophisticated, far more sophisticated. We're, we're stimulating a chemoreceptor, which is a very simple thing. It's either on or off. You know, we, what we've got to do, like I mentioned that like 30% coverage thing, we've got to turn 30% of the amino acid light bulbs on, right? And try and stay there. Yeah. And, and that's what we do. How, how, how do you know that that receptor site is at 30%? How do you a, know it's, that? it's a best guess. Uh, right, it's a right. fixed number. And we're kind of working backwards because we know what concentration works. But what coverage is that in the fish? No one really knows. I'm, yeah. I'm, because it's like a third of the way along the window, basically. So, you know, the, the, the effect starts at a certain concentration. It finishes at a certain concentration when they turn off. And I've just put a linear relationship there. So, well, it's... A, third of the way through it's 30 percent yeah yeah fascinating it's I, probably not exactly 30 it could be you know it could go as low as 10 or as high as 90 i just don't know but it's a fixed number and in a way it's irrelevant because as long as we know the concentration that causes the effect you know, yeah for the macroscopic view right that's what we worry about you just need to know the equation don't you that that's the yeah equation. we just need to know how much of this stuff do i add to get the right result yeah and you know what's happening in the fish it's nice to know but it's you know it's not needed really yeah yeah well, what's been the most surprising thing for you in all your years studying amino acids oh i think um the realization that kevin maddox was right uh, with <laughs> or, that's a long time ago as well 
Yeah, in 83, he said, yeah. amino acids that work singly, brilliantly, cancel each other out essentially together. And we were able to develop a model that proved that to be correct. And then discerning that there are actually four receptor sites for amino acids, and only two of the four are really relevant. The other ones, you know, nature has decided, you know, not to really use them for whatever reason. Mm. And I think I too, because the acidic site, which is the receptor for MSG, essentially. If you look at um, literally any profile of any food, MSG is usually the most extremely abundant amino acid by a big way, right? And if you think about it, well, if that receptor was turned on, it immediately gets saturated. And so it's kind of, you know, it's not really, <laughs> really helping at that point. So, you know, by zooming in and, and using kind of these two kind of different, very different but at the same time, equally potent kind of amino acids uh, as kind of keys to the locks. It seems to work that way. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. You you were you weren't a Hutchy man then. You were you were Kevin Maddox all the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Rodder who? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just pissed off another bunch of you. No, I was. Yeah, I was gonna say you you. Yeah. Me. No, absolutely. I mean, I I was a scientist, and I've always been a scientist. I I do love good writing. You know, but that's not my thing. I'm, I'm more of a kind of pragmatic kind of problem solver. And that's what Kevin Maddox definitely is. <laughs> so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I've got an interesting one for you. Like, we haven't really talked about how it's kind of a human interest thing. We haven't really talked about how carp fishing in the US is different from Europe. That's kind of a really interesting story. You know, how yeah. I go about my every day as a yeah. life as a carp yeah. angler. You know, and, and it's just so different. Like, you know, there's no such thing as a commercial fishery here. There's no such thing as like a landing platform or a bivy or anything, you know, any of this stuff. It's, it's like Wild West Frontier over here. You know? we, we should definitely talk about that. I mean, I, when we spoke before, Patrick, I think I looked up our stats um, yeah. and just over 5% of our listenership is from... Now I'm going to piss off some people. <laughs> it is from Canada and the USA. I know we yeah. all lump them together. I know yeah. it's very different. Um, apologies about that. I think it's 3.2 odd percent from yeah. the state, uh, United States, and then 2.3 uh, percent from Canada. Yeah, five percent. I mean, that's, that's significant numbers, and we certainly have we have these. Um, we have like a group of. I don't know what to call them. People that message us regularly and stay in contact. Yeah. Real close friends of the podcast, if you like. Yeah. Um, I almost said super fans then, but that would sound ridiculous. Yeah. Not definitely yeah. not super fans. <laughs> and, uh, but it's quite a few of those are, are, are from the States and, and from Canada. So it's obviously yeah. booming over there. I mean, yeah. you've obviously, you're someone who's angled, you know, to a high degree in the UK as well as the States. Yeah. What are the main differences? What 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 what's what's going on there? Okay, the main thing is that the the majority of American anglers fish from boats, right? So you know, bass is by far by far the biggest uh, market here. And then we call them zander, but they call them walleye here. That's probably number two. Yeah, all boat fishing. So you go to like a bass pro shop or any kind of fishing shop in the states. It's just rows and rows and rows of lures, basically. And then there'll be a little corner where there's some catfish gear, <laughs> right? Because catfish are a popular fish. They grow really large. And there's a, kind of a small dedicated group of anglers that go after the catfish. And then now we have a similar number of carp anglers. And carp fishing has really taken off, I'd say, in the last 10 years. We've got like um, several organizations, CAG, right? Is, is one carp anglers group in the United States. Lots of local carp groups. I mean, I'm in contact with uh, a number of local anglers who helped me test the product. And, you know, it's a very friendly kind of camaraderie type thing. We have regular kind of social fish-ins and tournaments, but it's a small group of people. And these are like, you know, a very small minority of the American fishing kind of community. But they're super, super enthusiastic. And we have some good um, bait and tackle suppliers now in the U.S. Um, there's Wacker Baits here in Chicago and there's a big carp tackle down in, I think it's Oklahoma and a few others. So we can get the gear, we can get the bait. And it's starting to become mainstream. I mean, I watch uh, these, you know, these uh, these bass anglers who have their shows on on the weekend, and uh, once in a while they'll go carp fishing, and they'll show a hair rig, and they'll they'll always fish with maize, but occasionally they get out of boilie, and uh, it's usually it is oftentimes in Minnesota or Canada, and uh, you know they go to some like windswept place, and they just start pulling out these twenty pounders, <laughs> and they're always American fish are wild. So they've never seen a hook before. They just, you know, you just pre-bait the day before with a little bit of maize. 
and you just literally empty the place. And um, it's fantastic. It's, it kind of reminds me of fishing in Ireland in the 1970s, you know, <laughs> tried that back in the day, but um, it's wild. And the fish are all long, lean and muscular. And if you catch a 20 or 30 pound carp on the river, you're in for a, <laughs> oh man, you're in for a shock there. They really pull. Mm. So um, there's lots of, you know, it's wild fish and I pay $13. That's 10 pounds, but approximately per year to fish anywhere in the state of Illinois. So somewhere about the size of, you know, England, <laughs> literally in length, maybe not as wide, but uh, some large kind of landmass. I can fish anywhere in the state for $13. That's the good side. The bad side is that no fisheries are really developed for carp fishing. So, you know, you're making your own swims, you're fishing municipal ponds and, you know, parks. Mm. So you got to deal with like civilians. Right? <laughs> what are you doing? You know, what's a long pole? You know, <laughs> Um, there is that downside, but, uh, you know, frankly, I mean, it's a small and ever growing, very enthusiastic population. And, you know, some of these anglers are really good. There's a lot of imports, a lot of folks from Europe, a lot of Polish guys over here fishing with us, a lot of English guys and, uh, you know, and a lot of Americans too. And, you know, when, you know, we recruit like all the time, I just go out fishing on the weekend and I, I'm pulling in like a 10 pounder or something, which is like every other fish. And uh, they're just, dumbfounded because they're used to catching a pound bass you know and uh they want to try it they want to do it and one of my good friends actually johnny wilkins uh maybe he's listening hello john uh he's actually a fishing tutor in chicago and he teaches people how to fish in in the european style so uh so yeah it's a small but uh very enthusiastic group and uh you know we we have the wild west it's literally a wild west frontier here with carp fishing you know you know, the state record in Illinois is like 52 pounds or something. It's all wild fish, right? They've never seen a, never, it's interesting. They've never seen a pellet, right? And it's kind of interesting because in the UK, you have the stock fish that kind of were bred on pellets and that's what they eat. Here, you can't catch a fish on a pellet, really. <laughs> it's all corn, you know, natural, natural baits. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a I lot mean, of stuff too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I can't remember who we were speaking to. I, it might have been Steve Briggs. I yeah. mean, obviously, back in the day, it, it was you know Cassien and and yeah. the, the the waters in France, and then you know some of the the waters slightly further afield. That was like the real pioneering, untapped yeah. excitement. Now people are looking at the states yeah. for for that yeah. because obviously all of Europe is saturated with carp angling now, yeah. and it seems like in the United States it's very much kind of virgin territory in terms of oh, absolutely, yeah. Angling. I mean, I, yeah. I catch fish, you know, you know, when you catch a fish and it's never been caught before, it's got that kind of little membrane on the inside of its mouth. Oh, the, look, come the, a lot. A fish could be caught several times and still have that. I think that's all oh, right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, they all, they all have that. So there's, ne there's never any sign of them being caught before. Right? Yeah. They're not all. Yeah. Yeah. I know what yeah. you're saying. There's no, know. there's no fin damage. There's no mouth damage. You know. I mean, those fish that you caught with the membrane, when you slipped them back, it didn't just dissolve, did it? You know? No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know yeah. what you're saying. They're, they're just immaculate yeah. condition. Yeah, yeah. they're, they're yeah. in fin perfect. And it's kind of interesting because we have our kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a statistical thing, right? Because you know that old saying that in the match fishing circles that 10% of the anglers catch 90% of the fish? Mm hmm exactly how it is with carp fishing in the U S because the folks that are using the European gear practice catch and release, you know, fish welfare, stuff like that. We catch literally all the fish. Right. And then once in a while, someone fishing with a size four hook with like 20 grains of corn on it will catch a carp. Right. And you know what they do? They kill it. Right. Mm. And we, we're like burying our head in our hands. And I'm thinking, well, my God, if these guys had our gear, they'd, there'd be no carp left. Right. Yeah. But really there's an evolution as, as people get into the carp fishing, they understand the conservation side and they kind of fall in love with the sport. And, you know, so, the, you know, every American carp angler I know who's really into it, they're all catch and release. No, no one really here <laughs> takes the fish home anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. The good thing. I mean, it's crazy, right? When you think about that in European terms, because carp were stocked in the U S during the depression as a food fish, right? That's why there's so many of them. And, uh, you know, people in the depression used to catch these easy to catch large fish out of the local pond. And, uh, take it home for dinner. And that has in some ways, you know, persevered, you know, on occasion, like I'll be catching fish and, uh, you know, when I'm match fishing and I'll be putting them in a keep net and people will come up to me when I'm weighing in and they'll be like, Oh, can you give us one? I'm like, no, 
<laughs> it was this crazy stuff. So, yeah, I, I remember many good. years ago, um, I used to work yeah. at an event park. We had a couple yeah. of lakes on site that had carpet. Um, and I actually lived on site in a caravan. This is going way yeah. back. And uh, we, we had some Polish staff come over from, from Poland, yeah. obviously. And uh, Christmas Eve, they invited me over yeah. for, for dinner. And on the on the, the middle of the table, they had this carp, yeah. you know, cooked and ready for that's us to feast Christmas on. Eve, it's a tradition, that's right. Yeah, that they'd, yeah. That they'd caught yeah. from the lake. I was like, fuck. Yeah, I had to explain, you know, obviously the awkward thing yeah. of explaining to them that you, know, you can't yeah. do that over here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's different. Um different traditions and and, and different yeah. ways but it seems certainly from this side of the pond that carp angling you know is uh, you know as we know it is really taken off in the states and that's obviously fantastic yeah to see. that's great there used to be like a larger match fishing community here but it's definitely swayed over now to big carp fishing you know so. yeah you, you yourself you, you you trying to single out the large carp on these waters or me what, what uh, are you doing well, when people talk to me, they say, oh, where did you go fishing last? And I go, well, I don't go fishing anymore. I go experimenting. <laughs> right. Yeah. Every, every time I go, I'm trying to kind of try something new. You know, I'm more into the kind of the experiments and the actual, you know, campaigns, if you wish, trying to catch a certain fish. But um, I fish like probably four or five waters all the time. I've got my kind of closest thing to an English commercial, which is probably 45 minutes in the car from me. It's a, uh, it's a two deep boating lake. And, uh, the only fish that can survive in the two foot deep boating lake because it's full of ducks and it's like really murky, a carp, right? Mm. Because it freezes literally solid in the winter. And in the summer, it gets totally baked, it gets oxygen deficient. So all the native species will die out immediately. And the most robust titanium fish is a carp. And uh, they do die, you know, once they get past a certain size, they literally get frozen in the ice. So they're all under like four pounds. And there's thousands of them. And that's where I go to test the baits because I'm able to do lots of statistics. Like, you know, I caught 30 fish on this bait and 10 fish on this bait, that kind of numbers. So I go there all the time. That's where a lot of my videos online are actually filmed there when I do the tests. And then I got um, locally to me here. Actually, I'm kind of in this uh, village of Plainfield, which is southwest of Chicago. And people probably know that Route 66, you know, the famous Route 66 song. Yeah. Route 66 actually starts in Chicago and it literally comes past my front door. I'm literally, I can literally see it from my house. And um, they, uh, when they later on, when route 66 was actually turned into an expressway, it's actually now the Stevenson expressway in Chicago, uh, I-55, they call it the uh, gravel pits, which supplied the gravel for the road were all dug in Plainfield, my town. And uh, I'm actually a member of a fishing club, which owns seven of these gravel pits. And it's all guys with boats fishing for bass, but um, a few carp got in there. And it's, it's totally clear. This is where I do my filming. And uh, some of them are real big. I caught a 40 pound grass carp out of there and my personal best carp out of there is 25. And that's where I go when I, when I have the big carp kind of <laughs> urge. <laughs> you know, I go down there with my, my maize and my pellets and I pre-bait for a couple of days. And it's not like the UK, if someone sees you pre-bait and they're going to jump in your spot. They, what the hell is that guy doing? <laughs> and I'm down there. Yeah. It's like, mm. what is that? You know, I'm down, you know, I'm out, I'm out there with it's like also like some alien just landed with all this gear. You know, they just they just stare at me like I'm crazy because <laughs> I'm the only guy that fishes for carp down there. <laughs> and so I literally have the place to myself. And um, yeah, that's that's where I kind of I it's, I keep it very simple. I use a bait boat to dump like maize and pellets, which are sprayed in the additive over a nice clean spot, gravel spot. And then I just fished like literally a corner line of rig over the top of that uh, in conjunction with a little PVA bag of pellets. And uh, I get a fish literally every 20 minutes. Wow. Yeah. I, I'd hate that. That That's not terrible. What, yeah. It's not what I'd want to do to be honest, yeah. but uh, yeah, no, I, yeah. I understand the. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in a way I'm a victim of my own success because uh, you know, these techniques are so effective, right? I mean, in England, you think about the hair rig came out in the, in the mid eighties and then we mm. started more and we've improved every year right and the fish are kind of wised up to it a little bit over time but these fish are like from the 1970s you know they still got like you know high heels and afros so they, they didn't know what's hitting them to be honest i mean can you imagine you go back in time to 1983 today with all the gear you own today imagine what would happen <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah abs absolutely and i mean it's changing yeah. subjects but i 
think a lot of people look back with rose tinted glasses to different baits and flavors yeah. and additives and it's you got to you got to judge that in relevance to what else yeah. was available at the time. Um, yeah, it's an iterative and, process. I mean, we're not going yeah. backwards. We're always getting better, you know. Yeah. 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 It's like I'm amazed when I watch TV, right? And it goes, "Oh, this, this is our best, you know, whatever brand car ever." Well, of course it is because you didn't make this one worse than the last one, did you? <laughs> you yeah. got to yeah. it slightly. <laughs> so it's always slight improvement, right? I mean, every time something new comes out, it's always a slight improvement on what was before and uh you know, <laughs> so I'm not really saying that's a selling point, right? <laughs> that's what they say. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Um, Patrick, where where yeah. would people find you if they were to wish to find you? Oh, so I've got a couple of places. Um, probably the easiest way to find me is just to kind of send me a quick message through the Carp Geek TV YouTube. Um, but I do have a website. Uh, it's called biosourcebaits.com, which is kind of a weird name. But uh <clears throat> It's bio, B-I-O, source, S-O-U-R-C-E, and then Bates.com. And there's like an email link on there, and they can just email me from there. But my contact information is all over the uh, YouTube channel. So yeah. if people are really interested in learning more about the product, I'd just say watch the videos I got at YouTube. It's kind of entertaining, and you know, you get to see me in person, you know, the Englishman at the American venue <laughs> fishing. A, you know, fishing, I actually fish with a you know 13-foot, uh, sorry, 13-meter <laughs> carp pole on this venue. Oh, wow. with fish and the americans are always walking around you know they i call them civilians you know it's got we got some funny moments where they, they're <laughs> me they say oh that's a long pole and i i got fed up with this and i, and I always start shouting back stupid stuff like that's what your wife said you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know it gets to the point where you've heard it so many times you just get <laughs> I then, I, then, I rem- to say that. <laughs> then, I, then I remind myself that 50% of Americans are armed at any one point in time, so I better calm down. <laughs> and, no, and this, this, this amino acid product, I'm, so, I'm sure there's uh, a lot of listeners that want to try that out. They can get that on your website as well. Okay, so it's kind of we're at an interesting point now because um, it's in the US, and my, my distributor is at a place called Wacker Bates, and uh, I think that's at the website. And if people contact me, they can, you know, people in the US which should uh, contact Wacker Bates. And they do ship to the UK, but the problem is that the shipping costs more than the product. <laughs> so it's not really cost effective. We sold a few to the US. Uh, but what I'm trying to do, actually, is I'm trying to find, uh, you know, a distribution slash manufacturing partner in the, in the UK. So anybody out there who's really interested in kind of, you know, working with me with regard to marketing and distributing the product in the UK, please get in contact and uh, that'd be awesome. Cool. Good stuff. We will soon have our uh, hook baits for sale. We can sling it on our website, but uh, I don't, I don't know if we'd be able to manufacture it for you. Well, I'll tell you a secret. I mean, um, cause uh, the people I've been talking to, I mean, um, it's actually a very, very simple thing to do because in its simplest terms, you, I would send the, pure powder to the, to the person who's going to make the bait and i would say okay dissolve this in whatever container we decide right so a 10 liter container right i'll provide enough powder and if you dissolve it exactly in 10 liters all you got to do then is just put it in bowls oh we can do that <laughs> so it's actually very simple the, the hard part of this is actually the mixing of the powders to get exactly the right ratio but that's done kind of this side of the pond right but then moving forward, you know, you think, well, you know, I tell them the secret recipe and then, you know, we sign a, you know, <laughs> non-disclosure and uh, yeah. buy the amino acids bulk and, and it's even more cost effective. Oh, well, there we go. Yeah. Ho- hopefully someone listening will be interested in that. If not, uh, maybe we could pass it along or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Be- I mean, uh, you know, I'm looking... I'm- it doesn't have to be a big company. It doesn't have to be a small company. It's just got to be the right person because honestly, this is kind of, uh, it's not my main business, you know, I mean, uh, I'm a, a researcher and, you know, I, I, I'm a chemistry professor. Uh, so I'm like, I'm, I'm more of a, a scientist, right? I'm not a business person. <laughs> so someone with the, the business drive and the ambition, you know, that's more, that's more important to me than uh, anything else really. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good stuff. Patrick, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I found it thoroughly interesting. If you ever want to come back on and and talk about um, more things carp related, we'd love to have you on. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Patrick. Take care.